The, uh, we took up a lot of uh, contentious issues uh, in the last Congress. We did things that uh, uh, I was afraid we'd never uh, accomplish. Bipartisan infrastructure, largest in the history of the country, uh, uh, just, uh, transformational investments in climate change and creating all kinds of uh, green, uh, green jobs. The, um, toward the end of the day, we uh, actually passed a budget plan uh, and the, the fund the government for the, the rest of the year. I mean, we did a lot. It was not for lack of, uh, of, uh, of interest in doing it. But, uh, but this year, I, I think we'll have less on our plate, having dealt with the infrastructure in a very, very major way, having dealt with climate change in a major way. I think we'll have more, uh, more room to take it up. I, I, let me use uh, this opportunity just for a minute. I, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm the last Vietnam veteran serving in the, uh, the U.S. Senate. Uh, I was a, a P-3 aircraft uh, uh, naval flight officer and eventually a, a mission commander. We flew missions off of uh, the coast of Vietnam and Cambodia during the Vietnam War, a lot of them, about 500 feet off the water. We flew a lot of missions tracking Russian subs uh, then and, and for many years after that. Um, we had uh, jobs in the airplanes, the air crew, uh, we, uh, but uh, we'd also have uh, jobs on the ground. And I always had jobs on the ground, like air intelligence officer, but always a P-3 aircraft mission commander. Uh, one day in an all-officers meeting, our uh, commanding officer said to about 50 of us or 50 of us in the meeting, he said, overseas, and he said, uh, I, I need a volunteer. And nobody raised their hand. <laughs> and he said, I need a volunteer. And nobody raised their hand. And he said, I, I need somebody to, uh, this was about three or four months before the election that year, even numbered year, he said, I need for somebody to be our voting officer for a squad. And we had 300 men at the time. We had no women in the, in the naval, almost none in naval aviation. That's changed dramatically. But um, he said, I need somebody to be the voting officer. I need somebody to get everybody registered to vote in their primaries, to get registered to vote in their general, and to vote. And who would be that volunteer? Nobody raised their hand. Finally, he said to me, he looked at me, and he said, uh, Lieutenant Carper, how would you like to be that volunteer? I said, aye, aye, Captain. And, uh, and we registered almost every single uh, person in our squadron. They voted in primaries. They voted in general elections. If they happened to be from Alabama or West Virginia or Wyoming or Texas, they got to vote in their primaries, presidential primaries. They got to vote in the general. If they happened to be from the District of Columbia, they did not. We were serving in a war that was hugely unpopular, hugely unpopular. And most of us had the opportunity to be represented in the Senate and the House here by votes. The folks who were there in our squadron from the District of Columbia did not. That is not fair. Thank you. I think uh, if you go back 15, 20 years ago, actually when it took the handoff from Joe Lieberman, uh, people thought it was a fool's errand. Uh, we'll never uh, do anything like this. We'll never provide the right to vote for folks from the District of Columbia. We, uh, but, you know, bit by bit, public opinion has changed. And I think the folks in, in, this, uh, in this body, I think that if you ask them privately in secret, uh, it's changed. And uh, I think the key is just not to quit not to quit. And I don't know if there's going to be a vote in the, uh, in the committee or, or in the, the full Senate, but I know this, we're not going to give up. This is the right thing to do, and we're, not going, to, we're going to change this, uh, however long it takes. People used to say of uh, Wilberforce, when he was in the Parliament in Great Britain, they thought he was on a fool's errand. You know, the Brits had supported uh, slavery forever, and there's no way they're going to stop doing that. Uh, he never gave up. We're not going to give up. The, um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I, I, I want to go down that path. Uh, all, all I know is this. Folks here in this, uh, in, who live in this district, they pay on a per capita basis more personal income tax, federal income taxes, than anybody else. 
13,000 of them are serving in uniform today. That's probably, in terms of on a per capita basis, about as high, high as any, anybody else. They need to be represented. They need an opportunity to vote. It's, that's, it's a premise that's that, that sensible. That's where we are, and that's where we're going to stay on that, uh, on that, on that path, and, and that's, that's the right thing to do. Thank you. Um, well, we, we've we've mentioned several. You heard the chairman um, mention mentioned several, um, but let me talk about a, um, a element of the Home Rule Charter that not many people are aware of, and what it gives us. While we elect a mayor and we elect a, a council, it reserved for the president of the United States the ability in an emergency to take over the Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, and we lived through a pretty tumultuous time where certainly nobody uh, would expect the Mes Metropolitan Police Department to report uh, to the president. Uh, you heard the senator uh, and Chairman Mendelson already mention um, something that no state uh, endures, and that's the inability to call its own National Guard. The D.C. National Guard can only be deployed by the President of the United States. And once again, uh, we lived through a uh, tumultuous time where the actions of the President we couldn't uh, really predict. Uh, and this Capitol itself was endangered, we believe, by the inability not only for the mayor to call the National Guard or to redeploy the National Guard according, according uh, to the situation at hand. So those are a couple of examples. Well, our approach uh, to the Congress and the White House, no matter who's in power, uh, is to make sure that we let them know who we are, that we govern ourselves, and that we pay our own way. Uh, and we will be prepared to deal with, with any actions that, that are forthcoming. Uh, well, the council and the mayor really ought to speak on this code. Uh, as you know, every bill that uh, uh, that the council passes has to come through uh, the Congress, and there's been some disagreement, not much, but some disagreement on this new criminal code. Uh, already we have seen some members of the House indicate that they will go after what the uh, council and the mayor have just done on the new criminal code. That's an example of what they, they do. Do you mind if I follow up? I, I, I just wanted, wanted to, to say um, that there will, all, there will likely be differences between mayors and councils, and D.C. is no different. Um, but any changes that we want to see in that legislation, uh, we will handle um, with presenting them to the council. And I'll, I'll just add that to echo what the, or to amplify what the mayor just said, you know, the legislative process, which doesn't include the chief executive, is one where there are going to be disagreements between the two branches. That happens at every state, and it happens in the District of Columbia. And uh, that's the case here with the criminal code revision. One needs to look more deeply at what we do with the criminal code and the, the expertise that went behind it um, and recognize as well that the district government has shown over 50 years that it's pretty good at governing itself and working out disagreements and resolving policy issues. 
And that's what that's what is here and will continue to happen with regard to our criminal code. So there's no need for Congress to step in and it would be wrong. Sure. This is a, another example of why um, D.C. statehood is so important, uh, because it's simply wrong to have uh, members of Congress uh, trying to veto or impose their will on the people of the District of Columbia against the wishes of their uh, mayor and the, and the council members. So, uh, you know, if, if Republicans in the House um, move forward to try to further um, – erode um, the, the the powers of the the mayor and and the council uh, and overrule them uh, we obviously have an ability here in the Senate uh, to push back on that uh, which is why I mentioned in my comments that um, we will we will fight hard to prevent any backsliding as we at the same time continue to move forward and keep the pressure on uh, when it comes to statehood So this is, again, the, the reason why we need to achieve statehood is because what happens often is we're in a position where if where Republicans can essentially threaten to shut down the entire government, if riders that have been on for years do not remain. We will work to continue to remove the riders that limit the ability of the District of Columbia through their elected uh, leaders. Um, to represent uh, the people of the District of Columbia. Uh, we will continue to work hard to remove those riders. Uh, in all the legislation, all the proposals that I've advanced, for example, in my subcommittee and that Democrats have advanced on the full appropriations committee, we've eliminated those riders. But when you have some members of the House and Senate, Republicans, who are willing to shut down the entire government if they don't preserve a rider that continues year after year, obviously uh, that, that illustrates <laughs> the fundamental challenge we've got here, which is why we've got to keep pushing for the statehood bill. That, that, that has been, that was removed again on the, when if you look at the House appropriations bill, the Democratic bill, as well as the Senate bill, uh, appropriations bill as written by the Democrats, those re that rider was removed because we think it's ridiculous uh, that the Congress continues to meddle and interfere in that kind of decision uh, for the people of the District of Columbia. Again, what happens is when you have Republicans who are willing to shut down the entire government, and that means in the Senate, obviously, uh, you, have, you have to get 10 Republican senators. Right? Yes, we had the votes in the House, but under our appropriations rules, we need 10 Republican senators to vote for any appropriations bill. And if they're willing to shut down the entire government over something like that, obviously it creates a real challenge. Again, that's why the long-term solution here is statehood. In the meantime, we are going to work with our colleagues. I will say, you know, the new uh, ranking member of the Senate Appropriations Committee here uh, is Susan Collins from the state of Maine. Um, in the past, I've talked to her about this, these issues, including that one. So maybe there'll be a, an opportunity, and we will fight again this year uh, to remove those riders. I don't have anything to report on RFK at this time. Okay, is there a plan to report? I don't have anything to report on it. Thank you. Okay.